Okay, got the red smoke. Gun run! North and south! West of the smoke! West of the smoke! Okay, copy. West of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. Come on with it, man. Give it to me. I need it. Get cleared hot. Captain, cleared hot. Oh, yeah. You got that headset on there? Yeah, I figured it out. Nice. Yeah, what are we going to talk about? I was trying to think about the last time we saw each other was in bear camp. Nope. Whitetail. Texas. Okay, yeah, you're right. Whitetail in Texas. And now we're in a pyramid. <laughs> so How well uh, laid out is this place? Incredibly. I <laughs> spent the last 15 minutes trying to get to the same floor. <laughs> this is actually my first time, not in Vegas, but the first time in the Luxor Hotel. How would I describe this to people? <clears throat> First off, I don't know how the elevator went up so high because everything is angled in, and it appeared that it was at the side of the building. That that was weird. I uh, right, twenty two floors it started up. going up, and it's like, oh, I'm going up to sideways. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. So do you, it's do like Willy Wonka designed this place. Did you do what I did and look over the railing and determine whether or not you could PCA that thing? Hundred <laughs> percent. Because uh, I've actually talked about it with with a number of people. We have plans. I'll let you describe what a PCA is. So you, uh, you're doing a base jump. Yep. And you trust somebody else not to kill you. So you hand them your little pilot chute, your, your pilot chute. The small parachute. The, the baby parachute. Yep. They hold onto it and uh, they yank it all out as you let gravity do the rest of the work, jumping it, off the object. And it opens really fast. So you could go yeah. relatively low and let's, what is it, 10 feet per average story in the U.S.? So 220 feet up? Yeah. I, uh, I tend to count nine foot a story, knowing that it's 10. That way I shortchange it. Um, when I when I eyeball stuff uh, because it's fucked me in the past. That's too low for me. <laughs> I don't think I've ever gone off anything that low. Would you go off or something? I've jumped as low as 117 feet. Ooh, I'm assuming that was either tied off or PCA. Yep. Is uh, that the uh, Rubido? No, that's like 160 something. I've freefalled that. Did you hear about the guy that went in there? Yeah. Well, he was doing an unpacked jump, right? Yeah. At think this think point, I think, I think we've think lost everybody too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how would okay? So an unpacked jump. So there's a parachute on your back, obviously for base jumping. Skydiving, you have two. A main and a reserve because you have time. <clears throat> base jumping, you only have one. You pack it like a reserve. You can take the slider off, which makes it open incredibly fast. You can mm -hmm. put the slider on, but it's made out of mesh, so it opens faster than a skydiving parachute. Probably about the same as a reserve. You think? Uh faster. It's depending on the design. I, I mean, it's a really big rig, so... It gets you from going fast to slow... Without killing you. Without killing you and quickly. Yeah. And then you could take all of the parachute off of your back, and there's a variety of configurations, but you could basically ball it up in front of you. You could throw it out over your head and drop down underneath it. You could roll over the top of it. I think he was doing a tarred over, which is you're holding it in front of you, mostly balled up and then you roll over the top of it. I think that that's what happened. Or he was doing a, a TARD, which is like a totally awesome rapid deployment. You're holding it in your hand, you toss it up. I feel like Miles made that term up. Probably. <laughs> yeah. And I want to have him on the podcast one day, but I don't know if I could contain him. You don't need to. I, uh, but I would have to. You just to. have to put like a lav on him. Like you just, like a, like a Bluetooth. You can't have him be physically connected to anything. His energy <laughs> level. This would just be uh, torn off the table. His energy level would be insane. But yes, totally awesome rapid deployment. And they, they work great. I mean, I've done a, a number of them. I've done of, quite a few off of the bridge only. Yeah. I've done some off low-ish objects, but I don't trust my technique to do it off something really low. Did they find him engulfed in the parachute, do you know? I don't know. Uh, yeah, I just saw that come up on the... I know his insides were probably outside. For sure. At 160 feet, yeah, that's... And yeah. It's, it's a quarry. So it's it's a soft landing down there. Did they shut it? Was that actually, was that a legal jump? Mm, ish gray area i think How it about now new well i mean te i mean if we're talking technicality it's probably not illegal yeah they're probably just enforcing the uh trespassing a little bit stiffer yeah it's interesting to see what happens when people uh accident or injury how the uh, response is to that mm -hmm. somebody's died there before at rubido mm -hmm. like, I, did, I did not know 25 that 25 plus years ago something like that i have never jumped there that is far too low for me 160 feet is i don't need to See exactly where the spitball lands. It's not even I seeing. <laughs> what's disconcerting? You can probably hear it. What's disconcerting <laughs> is being able to stand on the object when there's zero wind and talk to somebody on the bottom. Hey, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, can you move that tent? Okay, thanks. That works. 
I'm not into any of that. You can have all that. But you know what's funny is you could yell to people from the top of the bridge, though, too. Yeah, but, the, but the I'm not yelling. I'm, I'm talking at this volume to those people. <laughs> you can have every <laughs> piece of that. How much have you been jumping lately? Uh, Not a lot since I moved. Yeah, uh, I found myself in the same boat. There's a couple DZs near where I live, and I'm sure there's some good... I'm going to link up with Shapiro at uh, one of these so. point in time. Well, he hit me up over the... Uh, Christmas holidays, and I hit him back. And uh, I mean, I did bug the crap out of him to bug you. <laughs> well, that guy's busy. He was, uh, you, you know, between falconing and ice climbing, and then teaching paragliding. I was like, yeah, I'll drive down and we'll Arctic exploration. Yeah, yeah unbelievable. No big deal. Renaissance man, if there ever was one. Yeah, and his wife is awesome. I, love, I just need to get a falconer on the show, and I want the falcon on the table, just you, sitting you there. You should. Like, Does he keep him in a cage? Uh, no, actually, <laughs> that bird lives inside. <laughs> it does live inside. Oh yeah. And it has, like, its own side of the house, like its own wing of the house. Do they have any small pets? Oh, yeah. They have dogs. That's I'm talking, like, cats. Nah, yeah, I think they have a cat. Just curious how the, the falcon would think about... It's not a big <laughs> falcon. Like, he's, like... like It's a peregrine falcon, like, right? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I have yes. got to get him on and talk about Jeff that. Jeff is rad. Jeff is amazing. And he was yeah. getting into uh, flying. I saw him post something about getting a... He owns a plane. Su- he has a, book, a, a bush plane. A little super cub, right? Yep. With the big... It's a converted one, so it's got extra horsepower. He wants me to like fly with him up to the Brooks. He should probably take me. I have more flight hours than you. I actually know how to fly. I mean, I can figure it out. <laughs> here's the th- here's the <laughs> secret of flying. You ready for this? If you push forward, things get bigger. If you pull back, they get smaller. See, and then left is left and right is right. She doesn't appreciate it uh, when, I tell, when I tell Arlette. But I'm like, <laughs> it's got to be just like the SDV, but like faster. Yeah, I can see. Right, like, like I stick, can see your girlfriend that's in up, Alaska down, left, Airlines right. <laughs> co-pilot on a massive jet, not appreciating that you think it's a mini submarine. It's like a mini sub, but faster. I would just take some advice, avoid conversations and comments like that. Just take the loss quietly and try to find a. a but w. it's not a loss. It's more like me just like I wonder what wonder what this will do. You're needling her. I get it. <laughs> yeah. So uh, when I moved up to the last two and a half years, the jumping has been a jump when I travel occasionally, which is fun. Which is fun, but I miss it, man. I miss being able to just go over to Skydive San Diego and just yeah. rip out eight or ten jumps and then be able to be out of there before the sun goes down, for sure. I don't know if it'll ever... I mean, there's a... Have you ever heard of the lo- heard of the Lost Prairie boogie? Uh-huh. That's only, like, uh, I think less than an hour from my house. When is that? I believe it's in August. And, the, uh, yeah. and I say that because where I live in the valley, if there are fires, which in the vast experience of the two summers that I've lived there for <laughs> seem to occur in the months of August and September. It's uh, socked in. Oh, yeah. And I remember people talking about it. I was either going, I believe, on the first hunting trip of the year with Dud up to Alberta, mm-hmm. or there was smoke. So I think it's in the August time period, late August. That sounds about right. But doesn't uh, Eloy fly a bunch of their caravans up there yeah, and some you. otters? That's worth checking out. Yeah. There's a tandem drop zone well, in, in Sal- Whitefish. Salt Lake opens up in two months. In uh, Tuella or Ogden? Tuella. I've done a bunch of jumping out in Tuella, and I've done a couple out at Ogden. Both were good. Mm-hmm. I enjoyed them. That's where I met uh, Senor Marshall Miller for the first oh, time. I was just talking to him yesterday. The man, the myth, the legend. One of the nicest people ever. Yeah. Yeah, he's cool. i got to link up with him again, too. Good teeth, good hair. You know, He, he makes sure the image <sighs> is there. Strongest teeth. <laughs> I think he is using whitening strips as he's base jumping. That son of a bitch. Probably. He'd be. I gotta get him on the epi- uh, on an episode as well. I met him the day we went out and hit uh, Notch Peak. That's the. F- well, I uh-huh. met him in brief passing, and then we went out to Notch Peak and did that project for five eleven. I think we jumped that thing five times, and away we were going. Yeah. He was funny. We were, you know, the deal having a camera crew there. It um, not a pain at all. It's. I'll describe it as slower than you would go <laughs> if it was just people there. And you were just going to do it for yourself because you would get packed, you would get ready, you'd brief the jump with your buddy, you'd execute, you'd repack, get back in the helicopter or hike there. And he was talking about, I don't know any of the names of the exits, I don't even remember the direction we were facing, but we would, uh, we bombed off into what looked like a smaller little valley and made a left hand carving turn, came over a saddle and then down and around. And uh, he was describing it to me and then he was following me. So I was just kind of doing it blind. Yeah. I maintained altitude, you know, like I I gave myself a buffer. I've been there. And okay. uh you go there and there. Okay, yeah. then you're gonna I can't really show you, but here's, I was just here's following what the you're geography. gonna see next. Like yeah. I, I could see most I, I could see 
my exit point, I could see the left-hand turn. I could see the saddle that I needed to clear. Beyond that... I mean, as long as you don't have, like, a huge amount of cognitive load, which a lot of people do, but if you just relax, and if you're jumping at the right pace, you should be able to take on extra information like that. Yeah, and we had the helicopter ride up there to look at it, but I just appreciated we got down. He was like, good job. It's like two people went in right on that saddle. I didn't want to tell you about that before we did the jump. <laughs> oh I was God. like, damn, Marshall. <laughs> <laughs> or just past the saddle. I don't know what they did, Ooh. but they got themselves into some trouble. So I, I had a different scenario where I went somewhere and jumped, and they're like, yeah, so that's where so-and-so died. I'm like, oh, thanks. I think I'd prefer to get that information after. Real cool, dog. Yeah. And they're looking at me like, oops. You know it would be a good time to tell people that is on the car ride home? Yeah. You know, like when we're done with that exit. Done with the day. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I appreciated Marshall's professionalism. He was Johnny on the spot, cameraman, too. Like, he was completely in slot the entire time. For as goofy and fun to be around as he is all the time, he is hyper-professional when he needs to be. Yeah. He does winter sports as well, right? He is a damn good skier. Skier? That's what you said, and then you were just covered in powder when we were in Idaho last year. Yeah, and that's why I have a snowboard now. Oh, do you? Oh, yeah. What'd you go with? Uh, I have a split board from Arbor. Mark is hooking me up. Carter. Thank you, Carter. Do you have a regular board to ride the resort? Uh, I have a cheap one, and then he's getting me set up with it, uh, with another one. So I, I went and like grabbed one to like do some Bunny Hill stuff to like figure it out. Yep. And then I'm going to get a good one from him. Perfect. And then just crank on both. We should do a combined trip to Jackson Hole. Uh, yeah. He's been getting just... I look at his videos, and it's like, okay, you got seven feet of snow last night. That appears to be pretty good. Dude, Brighton has 310 inches this season. Really? Uh, yeah. That's got to be over the historical average. It's out of control. And that's in Salt Lake, right? Yeah, last year we had 500 inches total. And they already have a 310-inch base layer? Holy cow. <laughs> yeah, the mountain up in Whitefish is, I mean, it's not doing bad, but it's not having the banner year that it was the last two years. Ugh, it changes is, the riding for sure. Yeah, it does. It makes me want to put the nicer snowboards away and just grab something where... <laughs> something crappy. When you're riding along, tunk. <laughs> oh, I I had a... Speaking of split boards, my first turn on a brand new split board on the heli trip we were on. Oh, yeah. I made that right-hand turn and just heard... <laughs> on the very that's first turn. And it just a gouge on the bottom of that Jones split. And I was not... I was not super happy about that. Yeah. How the hell did we get down this rabbit hole? Uh, we were going to talk about photography. Skiing. And, Okay. And then I said I'm starting to snowboard. Because I skied for 10 years, and now I'm like... Have you tried snowboarding yet? Yeah. Have you gone up and oh, yeah. done the bunny hill thing? How'd you like it? Uh, it took like a day and a half to figure out, but yeah. now I'm, I'm doing okay. Like, I can manage to get down the blues without killing myself and, or crashing. That's not too bad. Like it's I been, forget how they are rated. Is it greens like, and then blues and then blacks? Yeah, it's like bunny and then green and then blue and then black and then double. Just go fast. Yeah. It's the technique I go with. Well, that's, yeah. So the problem is I've been skiing so long that, well, long enough where I'm like, oh, yeah, speed, speed, speed. And then it's like, oh, it's a fucking snowboard. Edge. Pow. Yep. Never mind. I've had my snowboarding style yeah. described as going very fast and then blowing up. <laughs> that's uh, that's how I, I feel. <laughs> which I feel like it could be accurate. What happens is I get super scared and then I go full edge deflection to slow down. <laughs> Especially in the trees, because I'm just like, ha, ah, and I'm sure I'm looking at the wrong thing. I'm like looking at the tree I'm trying to avoid, so I get behind the power curve. And if anybody ever snowboards with me and is following me, don't go behind me, go in front of me. Because when I get scared, I completely check stop, and it will screw you, and you will, you will pile up like you are on the freeway. And uh, yeah. yeah, it's It's been super fun, though. Like I'm, I'm convinced that I'm going to be doing way more snowboarding than skiing. Like, I'm... Well, with the split board, I'm assuming you did cross country skiing I did. before. Yeah. I did like or a, touring uphill stuff touring. Yeah, and I mean it's. I have a split, and that thing is ridiculous. Yeah, and I've used it as a split board already, like just for moving around, just to yeah. try it out. Like a, and like I was talking to Mark about it, and that's how I got to be convinced. He's like, "Look, dude, if you have no vested interest in skiing, like if it's not something you grew up with and you just absolutely love it, yeah, like why are you skiing? Like if if you enjoy doing backcountry, and you grew up like I grew up in L.A." Did, Not a lot of backcountry did, did, traditionally. Did, did enough. Did enough, like a little bit of surfing and and skateboarding, like a bunch of skateboarding, and then stationed in Hawaii, did a bunch of surfing and skating, and it was something where it's like, why not just snowboard? Yeah. Like, are you being dumb because you're dumb? Or are you being dumb because you don't know? I didn't know. And yeah, then and I I didn't know. The first time I ever got on a snowboard was in a co my first Kodiak trip in Alaska on ice with yeah. no helmet, 
instantaneously got turned backwards and got knocked out. That's when you need that. <laughs> and, well, and I was like, I swore it off from right there. I'm like, yeah. this is the dumbest thing ever. My head hurt for days. I kicked the thing off. I'm like, I don't want anything to do with this. And it is outrageously frustrating. Yeah. To try and learn that specific sport as an adult. Have you watched the Jeremy Jones trilogy, The Deeper, Further, Higher? Oh, yeah. And I might have gotten those out of order, but that is actually my brother-in-law turned one of those on three years ago, and the next day we went up to one of the local resorts, and I rented a board and just augured my face in over and over and over again. They're killer. That in, uh, what, Fourth Phase by Travis Rice? Yes, all of those guys. insane. Yeah. That's a level of commitment (laughs) that I don't know if I'm comfortable with on some of the things they do. And, you know, I'm hoping that I get to where... I'm boarding in that like it's like I can see because we had a really good powder day earlier this week where it just felt way more natural and Surfy. way nicer than skiing ever ever has. You know, it, ten seasons of skiing and I've never felt that like exactly how that felt like that surfy. This is really relaxed. Feeling. Can't compare it to skiing because I it, ski <laughs> when I was younger, but I don't think we ever. I have. I've never had a powder day on skis. Because, like, you've seen me ski when we did the heli skiing. Like, I'm, I mean, I'm proficient enough where I can manage to do what I need to do. In I'd say average, almost, little below. Almost any condition for... Yeah. Average, little below. Being green. Yeah, yeah. C minus. Yeah, C minus. I mean, it's passing. <laughs> Barely. <take> pass. Barely. <laughs> 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 but uh, I never had a day like that. Like, not even when we were heli skiing. Yeah. Because it, there's always something going on. Like, it's something, something's clicking. Something's banging into each other. And that snowboard... Not at all. I Wait till you hit yourself in the back of the head with it. <laughs> the yeah. best way to do that is go as fast as you can forward and then catch your front <laughs> edge. Toe edge. And then I usually go <laughs> arms out in front, and I know what's happening as it's happening, and then I feel my neck start to crack, and then I get kicked in the back of the head. And I sit there, and I go, God damn it, who just kicked me in the back of the head? Yeah, I'm waiting for it. And it's me. It's, it's just complete <laughs> scorpion. Who ran me over? Oh, I ran myself God. over. I had one last year. I still remember <laughs> the exact place that it happened. I face planted so hard, going so fast. It was into the powder, thank God. It was just over this lip. And as it was happening, I remember just saying, oh, no. And then I just smacked myself in the back of the head with the front of my board. But coming from skiing, one upside, you still have all your equipment. Uh, Yes. That's a win. Have you heard of the mystery I've, hero? I've had this happen. Where I've like crashed now, like in you know the week of gigantic amount of experience that I have on a snowboard, and I crashed, and I'm like, ah, oh, but I don't have to go look for my fucking poles. <laughs> have you great. heard of the mystery hero on the slopes? This is a concept that was introduced to me the last time I went boarding. No. So, I don't know about you, but my favorite thing on the lift up is to watch people detonate and just a full explosion, no, like poles yeah. are like eight to ten feet above them. Total yard sale. Total yard sale. So the mystery hero, and I think this is something you just say to yourself. You're not allowed to say it out loud, I think. But you basically stop and you collect their stuff for them. Yeah. And then as you keep going, you tell yourself, mystery hero, hero, hero. (laughs) Patting yourself on the back. Yeah. It was. I like that concept, but I think it'd be better if you like took one of their poles with you and just disappeared. Sorry, man. I couldn't find the other one. Like a semi mystery (laughs) hero. You help them out a little bit, but at the same time, they're short one piece. Teach them a lesson. Yeah, they get gear adrift. Yeah. You're just cleaning up the mountain. You left it out there. Yeah. I don't know. That's how my mind works. Um, oh, yeah, we've definitely lost people at this point. We're <laughs> deep down the hole. Talking about winter sports, though, I wanted to. I definitely wanted to talk about how you're deep diving into photography because mm-hmm. it's uh, it's something I need to do a better job of. I just started a page just for the podcast to try to actually treat the podcast like a – saw that. Not a job, but I just want to professionalize it. Like Its own entity. It's its own entity, and I want 2020 the year where I pretend to be an adult. You know, Perfect. 42 years old now, maybe... You can pretend for 365 days. I know. It's, I'm going <laughs> to do my best. But it, it does actually help. Um, I don't know. The, the vari- I've sat down recently and talked with somebody who comes from a, a background of dealing with brands specifically. Not that I think of myself as a brand or a podcast. Both, I definitely don't think of myself as a brand. And I, I had no idea what I was going to do with the podcast when I started it. But it's at the point where I might as well treat it seriously and, and see where it goes. Photography being an aspect of that and getting a better camera so for the i forget how you described it. i think it was color gradation or variation regardless i needed a better camera yeah. and then i was thinking about you and i was looking at your instagram and <clears throat> you've done some gnarly photography stuff snow sport wise so yeah we should probably go backwards about what you've been up to yeah um the most recent thing i did was i just got back from dog mushing up in fairbanks with jeff reed was that the race 
Uh, no, so prep not, for not a race. race this time. Well, he's kind of prepping the team. So um, his son, Atlas, got real sick right after he was born. So, so we they, should describe this guy as well, uh, too. So Jeff and I went through Buds and everything together. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we got out almost the same time. Was he from Fairbanks or Alaska? No. He's from Pennsylvania. Okay. I like this guy. Oh, yeah. Interesting life choices. Yep. And uh, <laughs> kind of like Cole Kramer, where yep. he's like, I want to be a mountain man. Like, had that kind of thought. And Cole is a mountain man. Goddamn, Jeff did it, too. He's like, he and uh, Jerry, his wife, were figuring out what they were going to do and whether or not they were going to stay in Virginia Beach because he was an East Coast guy or go up to Fairbanks. <laughs> and she got the job in Fairbanks, and he's like, Yes! What does she do for a living? She's a PA, physician's assistant. Yeah. How did they settle on Fairbanks? Had uh, they visited it, before, or was that's it? where all the dog mushers come from? So, and he had zero experience dog mushing, but he knew that he needed a dog mush. Precisely. I know. I like this guy. I like even him. more. Jeff is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that guy okay. is awesome. Um. So last year, well, not about two years ago, he hit me up, or I hit him up, something like, "Hey, man, looks like you're doing some cool stuff." Uh, and he's like, "Yeah, if you ever want to come up, like, come on up." And I don't care who you are, but I'm not going to turn that down. Oh, you're going to teach me to dog mush? Yes. Okay. And so I went up there, and the race got canceled due to weather. But I was up there for a week and learned how to mush. And then I told him, I'm coming back every winter. Like, absolutely. And this winter was the second time. And weren't the temperatures negative 40? Yeah. Um, negative 40 is a cool temperature because it doesn't matter if you say Fahrenheit or Celsius because that's where they They converge, meet. right? Yeah. yeah. Right, at, right at 40 below. Perfect. Uh, so we had some 40 below ambient temp days where in the uh, in the river bottoms and some of the sumps out there, it's probably 45 plus below. Is that cold enough where if you throw a glass of water up in the air, it'll freeze before it hits the ground? If it's like room temp, um, yeah. I'm sure it would start getting there. I think that's more like the 60 plus below, <laughs> which, which okay, get this, haha, funny. <laughs> um, it was 60 below at, at Sourdough, which is uh, one of the checkpoints to a race that was going on while I was up there. Best name for a checkpoint ever. Holy crap, right? Yeah. Um, and they're out there operating in that. Oh, yeah. Sleeping. And in shit. what? Tents. A thin walled tent, like an REI tent? Yeah, but they bring uh, wood burning stoves. You seen like Aaron Snyder um, always does that with his like. Uh, yeah, I've yeah. seen those tents it's before the camping. with the, with the yep. flu that yep. comes, the yep. metal yep. flu that comes up. Okay. So I know they do some of those. Um, <laughs> That's still extremely cold for a very thin layer of fabric to be keeping you from. It's the full on insane. But I like that sort of shit. Um. <laughs> Fair. I mean, I, I mean, I, I don't get me wrong. I literally I volunteered un- to do it again. Yeah, I can understand the calling to do that. How do you keep your photographic equipment working in those temperatures? So that was something I tried to figure out last year, didn't quite get it right. And then this year, I think I got it right. Um, I'm shooting a Fuji system. So mm. I have the Fuji X-Pro3, which is their new mirrorless. and a Fuji, I have the X-Pro4. It's not a big deal. It's the newest. I don't even know you would have. I'm just saying that yeah. I have so one slightly better. I have one. I have one of those and an XE3 for anybody that's listening. And uh, are those so those ones you can adjust the lenses on? Oh yeah, because yeah. I'm looking at this. And for people who are not interested in photography, now would be a good time to tune out. But it's. Uh, oh yeah, there you go. Grab. Yeah, yeah. I have my bag here. Yeah, cool. So if you're on the, I can put them on the table. Video so format. People, people that are watching it. video. Do you um, shoot with anything that's a fixed lens, like a fixed 35 millimeter lens? That is. And this is. Then, uh, yep. But the so. lens is so much bigger. Yeah. So that's the camera I took up to uh, to Fairbanks with me. I'm going to feel free to just you twist just and go turn ahead and all do these dials. <laughs> I don't give a shit. I'll figure it out. <laughs> okay. um, so I took that up with me, and Fuji actually uh, advertises that will work in negative 10C. I think that's what they say. Anyways, really cold, which is phenomenally cold for a digital camera. But <laughs> so if this is a digital camera, is this little lever just a throwback to the old? No, it's for a thumb. Oh, can you just pretend like it's a throwback? Yeah, to Andy, the old? it's a it's a throwback. That's why I thought. To make you feel cool. I just want to make sure people understand how technologically savvy I am. <laughs> but um, the understanding I have of all these pieces of gear. <laughs> so those are the cameras I took up with me. Um, I like them because they're simple, and I like Fuji because I switched to Fuji from Sony because I wanted something uh, that was. For me, you know, going back to like what we used to do, it's mission specific. Okay. This is gear that will last for the kinds of trips that I do. And this is gear that like I'd heard that a lot of Nat Geo guys have used some Fuji systems because they're relatively hardy. They're kind of small. 
they have really good weather sealing and they do well in weird temperatures, really low, really high. Yeah. So they and got a good range, but this thing doesn't zoom, right? It's a fixed lens. I, I have, so like, that's a telephoto lens. That's the term I was looking for. Yeah. Telephoto. Telephoto. Um, and I just held up a... But you do a lot of photography zoom. without a zoom lens, correct? Oh, yeah. I So I actually like shooting, uh, we call them primes. So like a fixed... It's very twitish. Yeah, it is. I like shooting those uh, because it's hard. And Why it's is it hard? hard? It's hard because you have to frame it correctly. And you have to know, like, okay, if I'm here, that works for this lens. Or I need to be here. And it, it kind of makes you... Makes the equipment... Makes you have the equipment work for you instead of letting the equipment just determine, oh, I can stand wherever the fuck I want, and then just, like, it'll do all the things. And you let it compensate for you? Yeah, which I think is, it's fine, right? And sure, shit, I miss shots. I do. And in situations where I can't miss a shot, I just throw, like, a telephoto on. But most times, I have the leeway with the kind of work I'm doing that I can do this. So you have to be closer with that straight 35? Yeah. Um, and so... I took this up there, and <laughs> what I did was I put a, a foot warmer, like one of the sticky-backed foot warmers, on the hand grip, which is where the battery is. That makes sense. And then I took uh, seven batteries in the field with me. <laughs> How long were those things lasting for you? A minute and a half. Maybe a minute. Holy cow. <laughs> How would that be in like a... I mean, we're sitting in Vegas right now for the shot show. How long would that last you out here? Ambient temperature is 60 Fahrenheit? Uh, until I took 500 pictures. Okay. Until, yeah. like, until I actually drained the battery, which could be uh, all fucking day. You're lucky you took seven then. Yeah. <laughs> so how'd you get so deep into photography? Because um, I kind of remember where you, I remember when you were on the jump team, you were already messing around with editing pictures a little bit, yeah. but I don't think you were as deep into the still photography yet. I wasn't, and I had done a little bit of it at uh, at SDV because we were like a... The pick course? Yeah, and, and we did a lot of like SR stuff because that was... Special reconnaissance know, the, for those of you listening. The thing that the team did, um, and I always liked it, and I... I went to an art school before I joined the Navy. Um, I was only there a year, but... That was for drawing, though, right? Yeah. Um, but my parents always did photography because they're both artists, and so I, they'd always been around the house. Um, I had always screwed around with them, and it became an outlet for me to do the artistic kind of framing that I wasn't doing anymore, that I've now picked up since. And I really just fell in love with how I can take a picture of a th of a thing, a person, a time, and convey my emotion or that thing or person's emotion for posterity, which I think is really cool. So I attempted to make fun of your description. That's fine. I'm going to withhold that, though, just because it's the year of being <clears throat> an adult. Yeah. I just want to rip that to pieces. Get it. <laughs> <laughs> Not going to. <laughs> so how did you start, though? Um, you Did you really dive in once you started hanging out with Twight? No, nah, I think it was a little before that. Because uh, he's a good person to learn with, from. With Jim. Okay, yeah. Um, Jim Woods. Team, with, yep. Which Jim's a great photographer, too. Um, and he's been doing it a lot in the air, and he's done a lot of movie work. So I kind of had an idea of some of that stuff, and he was good to talk to about a lot of it. And once I started going down that path, that was right about when you introduced me to Twight. And then... Uh, he has a thing for cameras. Oh, my God. That would be the polite way to put it. Yeah, and Mark is <laughs> phenomenal. He's um, one of the most interesting human beings that I know. Yeah, intense does not uh, do it justice. Yeah, and if you're not going to put in 100 percent with him, then yeah, you just can fucking fuck don't right even off. Try. Yeah, just just fuck off. Um, and that's what I've been doing is trying to put it 100 percent in with him, and it's it's been great because now I've met Ben Staley, uh, Mike Thurk, uh, Bonnet. Like, there's a bunch of photographers that have rolled through. I don't know any of those that, names. That are friends of his that are yep. also incredibly good photographers. And the ability to learn in that space is just like being back in a team room. Like, I can truncate the learning process by a gigantic degree. What's the biggest thing you've learned so far, or some of the biggest things you've learned so far that have helped? Carry it all the fucking time. So have it on you. All the time. Shocker. <laughs> I, I, like, and people have asked me, like, oh you, oh, you have your camera with you all the time. Like, yeah, it's it's repetitions. Yeah. Do you want to get good at something? Well, yeah. Okay, then take a damn picture. That doesn't mean pull your phone out and take a picture with your phone. That means take a picture with the implement that you're going to use. Sometimes you can use your phone. Yeah, I'm not saying it's not. But if you're going to use a camera, yeah, a still camera, a physical one, not your phone, then use it. Get repetitions. Otherwise, you're going to be shitty at it. 
or you're going to look clumsy. And if you're clumsy, you might miss something. So for me, like something like this, I'm holding like the XE3. It's small. It's easy to carry around. This is my like carried around, knock around camera. And then I keep this lens on, which is like a semi wide. Mm -hmm. And it'll frame up everything. And I can just like turn it on and okay, I'm cool. Like that's what I want a picture of. Cool. And then I just put it down. I'm good. Do you use that screen on the back or the viewfinder? It depends on the situation. Um, almost all the time, these are built kind of like a rangefinder, which means the viewfinder is in a specific spot and you can like see right through it. Yeah. Uh, not with this one, but with the X Pro 3. And often I'll pull it up and do that, but I keep both eyes open to see what else is going on. Interesting. How fanatical is Twite about pictures? Uh <laughs> <laughs> So fanatical that he'll take the same picture over and over and over until he gets what he wants. And then he'll print it. And if it doesn't print right, it's wrong. That sounds about right. Yeah. It's actually awesome. I, I You don't run into people that are willing to put that much effort into making it correct. Not perfect. Correct. I find him to be like that with everything that he <clears throat> tackles. That's great. I, I'm... Absolutely. That's why I'm there all the time. I'm there almost every day. Really? Oh, yeah. You guys in there training as well, too? Yep. What else is that cat up to? Uh, they're don't doing... Don't tell they're any still secrets, doing like, but... No, they're still doing, like, strength and conditioning stuff. Yep. Uh, they're putting on a symposium February 1st and 2nd. Okay. So they're doing another one. Um, I think I stopped in at the second day of that one last year, right? Yeah. Okay. I was, go I was going to San Diego or something yeah. like that. I was in route. Yep. I mean, you're welcome to come down to the Feb 1 and 2. We'll see. Sure. Yeah. But they're still doing that. Um putting out more books. We just did, well, not we just, but like uh, end of last fall, we went to Death Valley with some other photographers and took a fuck ton of pictures and we're putting together a book. It's like a 80-page book. How many pictures would that actually be? Like a, a, lit, a literal fuck ton. How many is that? That are going to be in the book? No, I mean, how many did you guys take? Oh, crap. I don't know. Between like, there was like six of us. We probably all took a couple hundred that's not that many. And then, I thought you were going to say a couple hundred thousand. No, a couple. I mean, you the, need to get a better SIM card or whatever this is called, a flash card. A ton of pictures. <laughs> everybody took a ton of pictures. And then we started passing them back and forth. And everybody's like, hey, stop. We need to put this together. So it's, it's stuff like that. Like they're trying to continue doing the art and written word, the, you know, the defend analog. Like they're living that defend analog. Like, Make I've never heard that. Defend analog? Yeah. They, so he and Michael say that on a regular basis, and it's kind of the creed of what they're doing, which is like having a podcast, right? Yeah. That, that's an analog thing. I mean, it, yeah, it's getting recorded digitally, and it's getting put out digitally, but this is an actual conversation. We're For not, sure. We're not doing it over fucking Skype. Yep. We're here talking to each other. I've tried it over Skype. Uh, like, it like, sucks. Yeah, precisely. Unless you, you and I can do it because we know each other well, but if you... Yeah, unless you have years of experience with somebody. but Or you're like an amazing... I bet you Joe could do it because he's just so good at talking to people, but if you don't know the person but and even, have some experience, it's very clunky, I yeah. found. But even then, he's talked about that, and he's like, ah, it's, it's good to do it like, like we're doing it yeah. here. Yeah, oh, you have to, you know, for sure. I, it just comes across so much more naturally, and it's the same thing with cameras right i mean he still uses film cameras a lot of the guys he hangs out with still use i have a film camera that i still use where do you get it developed uh they're in town or there's place like there's a couple places in town there's some in seattle like there's some places that still do film Rel to, to a good degree relatively expensive uh yeah is there a uh <laughs> it ain't cheap resurgence or renaissance coming Kinda. through of the film cameras I don't know if there really is or if it's just like a hipster, like they want to believe it is. You know, the same thing as typewriters. Like, like do people actually use more typewriters or do they just want to believe they are? I'm not aware of anybody that I know of that uses a typewriter. Yeah, yeah. Although I bet you uh, Twite has a typewriter, doesn't I'm he? I'm sure he does. <laughs> he probably has a collection of fine Italian typewriters somewhere. He has a collection of fine Russian film cameras. <laughs> of course he does. I don't know how fine they are, but they're Russian <laughs> film cameras. Of course he does. <laughs> but uh, And he probably has a selection of ascots. I'm sure. I got my first one the other day. I know, People nice. didn't believe me. Why do you have it? Because I'm a fucking <laughs> sommelier. <laughs> is, that, is that what you were wearing? <laughs> yeah. Picture? I had to go on YouTube <laughs> and type in how to tie an ascot. And you then don't just I like wrap it around yourself? Well, I mean, that's kind of what you do. <laughs> the right-hand side has to be three to four inches <laughs> lower than the left. And then you basically wrap it around twice and you bring it over the top. It's like a mini tie. 
Well, I was going to wear my smoking jacket that I just got, but it wasn't in yet. So I went with a t-shirt and an ascot. People are like, you don't have, <laughs> yeah. People are like, you don't own an ascot. That's a, <laughs> that's a kitchen towel. And I was just like, how dare you? Of course I own an ascot. <laughs> I realized once I was going to be a professional sommelier, I had to dress up a little bit. So now I have a smoking jacket. I'm trying to find an ivory handle pipe and some tortoiseshell glasses, it's which I'll take though. Doable. I actually asked Gators to make me an uh, tortoiseshell pair. No, a single one. Well, a they, monocle. Are they going to do a it? Gators monocle. I'm going to talk. I'm here for, uh, at shot working with them, so I'm going to try to get Gators to make me a monocle. A Gator cole. I just think it would be amazing. A machine grade aluminum monocle, I, I with mean, like a chain that goes to the smoking jacket pocket. So, I feel like I should just go up to them tomorrow unannounced and be like, it'd be cool if you guys made a monocle. I don't know if Andrew remembers me asking him. He came up to the house and I was floating the idea. Um, and the bottom line is, is I don't know a goddamn thing about wine. Uh, I literally don't know shit about it, but I'm going to do wine reviews That's and I do them. Perfect. And I, they, I could line up five bottles of wine and they all smell exactly the same to me. <laughs> red, 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 red. That's what I put for color every time. I don't understand what people, it's like, how could you get more, why would you get more complex than just saying this is a red liquid? Mm, drinkable complexity um easier than calculus harder than algebra one i don't i don't understand (laughs) what notes are you tasting Mm. well i binge watched have you watched the documentary series psalm i've seen parts of it there's psalm and then there's psalm into the bottle and there's psalm three i got hooked on that first uh documentary where they're studying for their master sommelier test i heard there was some controversy. There was, I, and I know this because <laughs> as a sommelier, I have to keep my finger on the pulse of what's going on. So, and I'm going to probably mess up everything I say from here on out when it comes to the master sommelier test, which I will successfully complete probably in three weeks. If from, you get the answers from that from guy. February, which is exactly what <laughs> happened. Yeah, it's so. From my understanding, there are multiple levels of being a sommelier. I think there's an advanced, but then the master sommelier qualification is ridiculously hard to get. Do you have to be French? No. But it started off, I think, as a purely French thing. There was a guy named Fred Dame. Um, perfect. Perfect, yeah. Um, who is apparently just a savant when it comes to wines. And I think he was the first guy to go from the U.S. over to France and get his master's sommelier qualification or certificate. Probably a combination of both. It's probably an ascot. God damn it. He better be wearing one. <laughs> Some of the pictures of him in his younger days. Probably he comes had, on an ascot. He had sashes on. That's <laughs> oh one part of my game. <laughs> I could upgrade. A sash? I could upgrade my sash game. I like, could like over the shoulder sash, like you would wear. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm just making I'll sure. I'll embroider it. I'll put tassels on it. And then there's like a I don't special. Know if it's towel. like around the belly sash. There's a special towel that that you can put. I I I, I don't know. I spend too much time on <laughs> Google, and I'm gonna get all this stuff. <laughs> but so you work your way up. There's a ridiculous knowledge based portion of it. Where in, I'm sure in that documentary, these guys were studying five six hours a night. I think for up to six months. Oh my god. And the cool thing is, from my understanding, is if you pass one portion, you're done with that and you can move on. So there's a knowledge portion, a service portion. Like there's no retread. Like once you pass, you're Yeah, done. you can slowly and incrementally move yourself along. So there's the knowledge portion, then there's the service portion where all of the master sommeliers that you're testing with, they like sit down as a fake table and they're the most pain in the ass guests that you could possibly have. Like, <laughs> I want pink wine and I want it to be 17 degrees and it's sitting over there at room temperature. You have like, you know what I mean? They're just yeah. being a total pain in the ass. Make it work. Or I'm having a hot dog and something or else, well, what wine yeah. do you recommend? And then there's tasting, which... All, all the weird like, I taste leather and cherry. I and guess, yeah. The wallpaper. Th- three whites and three reds, all of which, let's be honest, takes exactly the goddamn same. <laughs> These guys are like, it's crushed forest floor. This is... Uh, crushed turnip not a live turnip and this one of the guys is like this smells like the inside of a garden hose the other one was saying it was a sleeve of a uh tennis balls that guy i liked i want to see that guy smell that thing and then tell me it smells like that he would 100 percent look you in the face and tell you exactly that (laughs) it has that and then it has hints of chocolate as it goes down your throat um (laughs) but very few people pass and what i was reading is somebody uh I think it was on the tasting portion. One of the master sommeliers, because you have to, you taste it, you rate it, and then you call it, yeah. like where it's from. And I think they try to go to the exact year, the exact region, and the exact winery. Yeah. And that guy gave out a little bit of the inside little oopsies. Yeah. So I think one year, all the people who passed got it taken away, except for the one person who passed the tasting portion the year prior. Huh. That's like uh, that's like that dude that gave out all those tandem ratings. 
And they, oh, that's right. Then they yanked everybody's tandem rating that he gave. Which is probably a good idea. Super smart. But still, kind of shitty. <laughs> was he trading ratings? Well, I, I don't I wanna, don't remember what it was. Yeah, I don't want to actually... Yep, we'll yeah. just leave that alone. I don't want to yeah. speculate and uh, say that anybody did anything wrong other than the asshole that was giving out ratings without yeah, making yeah. sure people are qualified. Because I think that there were people that legitimately thought they were getting a rating. Yeah, and they probably were doing yeah. the requisite amount of work, but they, they just... They, did, yeah. yeah, they thought they did the process correctly, and he was not... He didn't have the authority... Yeah. To do it. The requisite authority to bottom line that qualification. He was not a master tandem sommelier. <laughs> it's the sommelier life is tough. It's gotta be tough. It's rough. You gotta go to the grocery store. I'm classically trained more than anything. It's meaning I classically buy my wine at the grocery store. Is it boxed or bottled? I haven't done a box wine yet, but I'm going to because I suspect on my refined palate it's gonna taste exactly the same as a ridiculously expensive <laughs> bottle of wine. I don't know. It uh I actually do enjoy wine. I just don't know anything about it. And I saw that movie and how serious that they were taking themselves. And I thought to myself immediately, there's some work that can be done here to make fun of myself and also these people at exactly the same time. It's perfect. Yeah, I don't know. But you have to admit, like a nice steak and a good red wine. It's good. It's pretty good. Yeah. I wonder what steak and white wine would taste like. Very similar. Just colder. I don't know. Maybe it would ruin it. I don't know. It's a classic. I mean, I'll, I'll do some pairings, like tuna fish and whiskey. <laughs> I'll do whiskey. I'm going to do like all, basically I'm just going to be a small A of all alcohols. <laughs> and uh, I'll take a sip of it and tell you what I think. And maybe I'll spit it out. I don't know. It's like people say, oh, are you going to do whiskey reviews? I'm like, I don't need to. It's the same thing as going and taking a gas nozzle and just putting it in your mouth and squeezing it for a second. They all taste the same. It all yeah. tastes like gas. It all makes my mouth burn. It's like scotch. <laughs> like, Okay. What am I going to do for scotch? I'm going to burn my mouth and then put my head over a fire. Do you think you could taste the difference blind between whiskey and scotch? If it's like super smoky. I was gonna, yeah, I think it, <laughs> like in the middle ranges, I don't think I'd be oh, able to. Oh, hell no. Unless it was very sugary. It's like wine. Like, okay, did I get it from 7-Eleven? I can taste that. Does it cost 10 grand? I can probably taste that. <laughs> Everything in the middle? I have no fucking clue. Red. <laughs> so I... <laughs> I used to work for an employer that would <laughs> let me talk see if I mm-hmm. can figure out the way to talk about this in the broadest of terms. <laughs> he was a fan of entertaining and we would be on the road. Uh, it, and this actually happened here in Vegas and there was a large dinner um with a lot of people and pre gaming had occurred. Yep. And very expensive bottles of wine started being ordered at dinner. And some of the people had, were deep enough down the rabbit hole that they didn't need any more of the wine. So I found myself sitting there with these bottles of wine that I'm going to guess low end fifteen hundred bucks and probably high end five thousand dollars. Yep, a bottle. And so I, of course, poured myself a very a goblet, robust. <laughs> you poured yourself a Viking goblet. <laughs> yeah, I found the biggest container that I could find, which is probably I'll take the size of glass. A, uh, yeah, an ice. <laughs> like, can I get an ice bucket? I'd like to fill this up. And I'll, I mean, I'll be honest with you, it was a little bit smoother. It tasted it pretty I, much the same. I don't know right? why it would be worth five thousand dollars. That to me is absolute lunacy. Yeah, like uh, so Brandon Jackson and yep. I, we took a trip to Vail. And he had inherited some bottles of Dom Perignon, like E three or something, eighty two. Sounds whatever. like a fine year. Yeah, I have no fucking clue. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure they were. I, th- I think they were like hyper expensive if you were going to sell them. But you know, sure. him being him, he's like, yeah, right. Like I'm just going to have them with my friends. So we opened them all. There's like three, <laughs> and we drank them all. We're like, oh, that, that was nice. Yeah. I, I, I mean, it doesn't feel like we drank a car, but I mean, <laughs> apparently we did. Wow, if you think about it like that, yeah. <laughs> like. I mean, but at the same but time, but it doesn't. But it doesn't taste like it. Yeah. Like I, I mean, all joking aside, at the same time, I can totally respect people who get passionate about that. I watched that Psalm documentary. I don't have what it takes to sit there and study that long. I would rather probably blow my brains out than try to have that <laughs> knowledge base. It is crazy. The stuff that, and there was multiple languages, and they had to know like brandies and ports and and all the weird stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So they champagne sparkling. So they can go up to a table and basically just read the table and ask people what they like. And and these pe- these are people that are going to end up at, like, Michelin star sure. rated, rated restaurants. I'm sure a bunch of them are out here. There's oh, yeah. some I'm really sure. nice restaurants out here. Yeah. And like I said, that uh, that meal where those bottles started showing up was one of those out here. Yeah. Uh, I think it was at the Aria. Oh, it, yeah, that's a nice place. It didn't suck. Um, 
I was just like, we're going to do this. <laughs> Mom, like looking around is a... Uh, I need a beer stein. Yeah, nobody... Beer? No, 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 no. Nobody's going to touch this. So we're just going <laughs> to rake that on in. You just did the uh, the Caddyshack. You're like, oh, I'll try some of this, and some of this, and some of this. I had to. I, I, when I'm, I'm, there's no way I'd ever be able to afford that, so I figured I'd give it a go. What else you been up to? Well, we were uh, going to talk about some other stuff. We were talking about photography. Oh, how'd you... Because then you... Started learning about it, and then now you're working specifically with Black Rifle just on content mm-hmm. creation. Yeah. So I'm doing um, a lot of their lifestyle, outdoor. Uh, the The reason they, the reason that Evan uh, specifically wanted me there and said that it might be a good idea is uh, I went and did a jump at the crack mm-hmm. and filmed a piece for them. And he's like, that's really cool. How about you do this instead? <laughs> Do you want to do, like, photography for us? Um, yeah, sure. And it's been cool doing that, and I'm in front of the camera and behind the camera for them because, um, like, you and I know a lot of the same people. Yep. And that was part of the draw for them, and I do all the things that they would want somebody to do. Yeah, it's a seamless, be able to do. seamless integration into what they have going on for sure. At a good enough level that I won't be in the way anytime. So... It was an easy yes for me. Yeah. And it's a great avenue for me to be able to do, like, the total archery stuff, go on hunts, go do the dog mushing. Like, everything becomes work, open field work yeah. for me. So how do you get better? <clears throat> like, what do you have as wickets for improvement? More reps. More, 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 more. Is that what more. it I mean, is um, it the same as jumping? If you want to yeah. get good at jumping, you got to jump more? It is. And it, it's more, 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 and it's still taking pictures for myself, too. Like, I, I carry the cameras and or a camera with me all the time. Yeah, everywhere. put that fanny pack on the table. Yeah. Steven Seagal would be proud of that thing. Oh, my oh no, God. No. That's this, not even a fanny pack. This is a shoulder pack. pack. This is a cross body. I was going to say, that's well beyond. Well, some people would probably rock that as a fanny pack. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. That'd be insane. <sighs> you went deep. You're like semi-messenger bag. But the thing is. Stop it. It got to the point where I was like. No good eh, sentence starts like him. that. <laughs> yeah. But the thing is. <laughs> But in actuality, uh, yeah, but I like I, I needed to carry them all the time, yeah. and I need to take pictures all the time, and I'm enjoying it. Like I, it's it's fun. Uh, you're good at it. It's interesting to watch. It's inspiring too. I look at the stuff that you're taking. I mean, I live and you live now too, and where we lived in San Diego was also equally beautiful. But I would say for different reasons, you get different uh, landscapes. Yeah. I mean, I'll be driving around Montana and just I'll just stop the car and look around. I'm like this is. Yeah, the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Like, so I take great. a picture with the camera I have on me, iPhone 11 Plus, Pro, what Pro Plus? I don't know. It's the big one with three cameras. <laughs> the, the three eyeballs. Yeah, and I look <laughs> at it. I'm like, that looks like a really small version that's not nearly as beautiful as what I'm looking at with my naked eye. I yeah. would love to be able to figure out a way to take those pictures with my naked eye. And it is doable to get a version. It's it's possible. To get the emotion you're getting from that view with the right equipment. It seems challenging because I always feel like the perspective is off. It is. The pictures that I take, yeah. it's con- it's similar, but it just doesn't, I don't know. I mean, you know, these are 35 millimeter lens and I don't know what the eye is. I don't know what the match is to capture that. It's a, God, I, I can't remember the numbers, but it's something crazy. Like we have like a 12 mil or 10 mil like a fisheye lens that can do like variable f stops and like we can take in a shit ton of light or no light at all and yeah our eyes are far more capable than almost the most capable cameras which is why it always looks different when yeah. you're looking at the final product yeah it makes sense have you looked at putting any of your stuff on uh and this is just something i was looking up the other day high quality prints on the uh metal i have um it looks awesome they do and i'm gonna take some of those pictures from death valley and do that for sure because some of them i'm really you should sell those things about. yeah do you have a portal already set up to do that? No, not yet. <laughs> You're so behind the times. <laughs> so far back behind the curve. Get a Shopify page, man. I will. It's I mean it's it's fun. And right now it's not like it's TTP. It's work, but it's not Trevor work. Trevor Thompson Photography. It's not tactics, techniques, or procedures. <laughs> you probably get sued by the military or somebody for the term. <laughs> oh man, I'm sure. <laughs> So you're deep in the photography. Yep. What else you got going on? You're going into snowboarding. Yep, getting into snowboarding. Um, going to get back into ice climbing with Jeff. 
Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. Uh, definitely going to be dog mushing all the time uh, in the winters. Like, I'm g- I'm just not going to – if I can not skip a winter, that's what I'm going to do. Like, I just want to go – A week at a time up there with him? I, next year I'm going to try and do two or three um, and really help train the dogs and help him because it's safer for him too. Like when it's, Oh, I bet. When it's 30, 40, 50 below outside – and he has to take a team of 16, that can be dangerous. Is right? that him by himself in yeah, those conditions? 16 dogs. Is he rolling with at least a satellite phone? Yeah, but, I mean, <laughs> you know, if you crash and knock yourself silly, like, you're you're still going to die. Yeah, or, or if you go through some ice. Or, like, there are. Oh, yeah. You now, going through the ice doesn't sound necessarily like, like what you're imagining. Um, it's weird. It's like the ice will freeze, yeah. and then it'll step down. There will be a cavity, and then more ice, not river. Oh, I was thinking like fully submerged, yeah, yeah, yeah. like so some Jason Bourne I, shit. I thought that too, and then he described it, and I'm like, oh no, wait, that's actually shittier. Because now you're not Yeah, wet. couldn't you get trapped in those voids? Yeah, precisely. So now when you have a second guy with you, mushing a separate team, yep. he can stop, come and get you. Ooh, that would be challenging to get out of solo. Precisely. So, you know, having me up there, even just this last week with him, is far safer. Because eight dogs is a lot to handle. But 16 is ridiculous. But you need to train the dogs. So, and you just run them to do that? You just, you just basically go they out on a course? Run. We were doing 30, 40, 50 mile loops. How you fast know. are they going? Uh, God, what is that? Like 9 to 11 miles an hour. What are you wearing? <laughs> oh, man. Okay. So I was wearing socks, Steger, Mucklucks, which are kind of like moose leather and rubber bottom. Uh, knee high. This already sounds like specifically for this activity. Oh yeah, muckluck. But well, I wear them for like shoveling snow too. But okay, way overkill for that. And then I was wearing over boots on top of those boots. So you're wearing two pair of boots. Two pairs of boots. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, a bib that was rated to sixty below. Oh my god. With long underwear on underneath, and my pants. These pants, like the Sika. Yep. Um, and then. Uh, Long underwear on top, and nothing else on top because I get super hot, like, and you do not want to get super sweaty up there. Yeah, it freezes. That death. could kill you too. And then I wore uh, like a mushing parka that he has, like an Arctic expedition parka. <laughs> and then I was wearing black diamond mitts that are rated at twenty below, with hand warmers in them, and liner gloves, and then beaver mitts that I made over the top of those. And taking pictures with all that on. No, no, no. So I had to take the mitts off to take pictures. <laughs> I was going to say. It was ridiculous. Like, my hands. You're probably about maybe 60 seconds of working maybe. time. Maybe. 60 seconds, then they're numb. Like, numb. So, like, I can't use them. And it's that's insane because you, like, <laughs> I'd set the shots up and then be like, okay, 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 we good? We're good? And I'd look around and be like, okay. And then I'd like tear the mitt and all the gloves off my right hand, grab the camera out of the bag and like run and take the pictures and then, oh, now it's dead. Oh, oh now my hand hurts. Oh, I can't feel it now. No, thanks. You can have all yeah, that. So we were doing that, you know, a couple times every run, <laughs> which the shitty part is it takes, you know, 45 to 60 seconds for my hands to go numb and then <sighs> it takes me five or 10 minutes to get feeling back. Up. Yeah. <laughs> to repeat the process. In 40 below. Oh my God. And I'm still rough. trying to like mush the dogs and control the sled and use all the equipment. And yeah. But I, but I like that sort of challenge. Like, for me, that's what does it. You know, like, and looking at Mark's pictures, going back to Mark, like, what is spectacular to me about somebody like that or what I'm trying to get to, and that's why I wanted to take up snowboarding because so many of our friends snowboard. Mm-hmm. And I want to be able to do big mountain and extreme condition snowboarding and skiing, uh, like the stuff that Jay Byers does, right? Um, in places like that and have the wherewithal and the ability with the equipment and the comfort to just take the picture. Yeah. The only thing I can uh, even make a comparison to, and I know this will apply to you too, is jumping and filming. Yeah. Because it, like, specifically like in our wingsuits, which they're, I mean, let's be honest, they're not, they're not that complicated to fly. As long as you're going forward, it's going to stay in control probably unless yep. you totally torque it out. But flying next to somebody is not the same as flying next to somebody and framing a shot and getting a picture that you have a limited amount of time in a dynamic environment to get. Not only do you have to be good enough to hold your slot, you have to have an understanding of whatever device 
is trying to capture yep. said activity. And outside of all of that, you have to be good enough at that activity. That it becomes secondary. And all the supplemental activities that you're not a hindrance. Yeah. Like when I'm up there with Jeff, right, he trusts me to be barehanded with my parka hood off and my face exposed in 40 below with us running around in the snow and me setting him up and he's cooling off too. Yep. Like the dogs are cooling off too. He's trusting me not to be an asshole and to know what I'm doing and get it done in a timely manner. It's crazy. That's why I look at people uh, like Jimmy Chin. Oh, yeah. Who's able to... What a pro. Not even... In so many different skills. In so many, whether it be snow sports or just his ability to rock climb. But he, I mean, yeah. even some of the pictures Mark had in his book, uh, Extreme Alpinism, the ability to be doing those ascents, but also at the same time document it without putting yourself and somebody else in jeopardy is unbelievable. And have the, the thought of, I want to capture that. Like... It's blowing sideways at 45 miles an hour. You just finished a super nasty, or Mark just finished a super nasty pitch up something that somebody might not have climbed or they died trying to climb it. Yeah. You are like, all right, cool. My buddy is simo soloing below me, so I don't have to blame him right now. I'm going to get my fucking camera out and get a picture of this shit and, so it's safe it. forever. And nail the shot. And nail it. <laughs> That's what's cool to me. Yeah, I don't know if I have that ability in any discipline i was okay at filming like gopro filming and i could take still pictures skydiving i think that's maybe the closest i've approximated in any activities that i've ever done it's, it was, i mean it's it, it was it's slowly a, approaching the point where i could put the jumping aspect a little bit to the side and just focus on like oh my shadows on this person i need yeah. to move or i'm going to go yeah. underneath or i'm going to change this would look better yeah. if yeah it started getting like that for me towards the end it wouldn't be like that anymore just because i don't jump as much anymore but uh, yeah, I don't know if people understand the level of... It's a forever process, which is what's cool to me. Yeah. Along with all these other skills that I'm trying to get better at. I mean, from snow sports to just adventure stuff like going to the Arctic or uh, climbing or hunting. Like being able to take pictures and be present for all of it and not be a pain in the ass. Like Dudley self-filming. It's, now cre- that, it's now incredible. That I, now that I look at it, like oh, as shit. hard as bow hunting is as it is. Let me make it harder. He's just sitting there when he's describing like, oh yeah, I'm facing away from the animal and I'm just following him on the viewfinder. And then I get it set up and then I draw and then turn around. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Talk about a master at oh, multiple sure. crafts. Yeah, un- like, undoubtedly. That, that's somebody else who's a really good still photographer. Like I've talked to John. He I've is actually to, an incredibly good I've photographer. I've talked to Dud a lot about photography and he has a ton of suggestions for me. He's like, yeah. Yeah, I know you should do this and this and this. And he's right every time. Because he had to take a shit ton of film photography to get for a long time to get where he was and then is now before digital. Yep. Like, well, that guy put the time in. He put the reps in. What's and your plan for the upcoming uh, 2020 season? What do you get? What are you uh, eyeballing? Everything. <laughs> God, I, I don't would. know. Last year was ridiculous. It was ridiculous for me, too. I actually had to, uh, I had to sit down and have a conversation with myself. Like, I have to back off a little bit. Because obviously the circumstances of my life that changed, yep. and there's a, I mean, people see me going and probably you going on these trips. Like I'm paying out of pocket for these trips. Like I'm not yeah. a sponsored hunter because I'm a fuck stick. Like I don't know <laughs> what I'm doing out there. Same story over here. When I'm successful, people are like, "What kind of elk call do you use?" I'm like the John Dudley, <laughs> and they're like, "What's that?" I'm like, I stand next to Dudley and I go, "Hey, I bring John with me." I'm like, "Hey, can you do one of those? Uh, you know that noise? So no, not thing. that. Yeah, not that noise. The other noise." <laughs> I mean, I can do like a cow call a little bit with one of those things, one out of maybe five times. I'm terrified to do it if there was actually an animal there. <laughs> but I had to have a conversation with myself. It's like, okay, like I don't, th- I don't think I'm going to be able to do spring bear. I'm going to yeah. skip spring bear. I'll skip moose. I think what I'm going to try to do. I was having a conversation with a buddy. Actually. I think moose is off anyways it's next year. I wouldn't doubt it. It's, well, fil- it's filled up. Yeah, which I would, is fine. I have way too much meat. Yeah, I wouldn't be able to go. But I was having a conversation with. Uh, <clears throat> did you ever meet Nelson? Oh yeah. Yeah. Heli skiing. Duh. Okay. It all blends together at some point, The beer slash heli skiing trip. (laughs) Yes. It all blends together for me (laughs) at some point. But, you know, he's like, hey, man, um, you know you live in one of the most awesome elk hunting states in the United States. I was like, yeah, that's true. He's like, why are you going to Utah and Alberta? I didn't use my elk tag this year. I didn't. In Montana? I didn't, know. And well, the reality is, I it would I think it would have been unethical for me to do so because I got incredibly lucky and I got that Alberta bowl and the uh, Utah bowl. Yeah. um, be, I'll be working on that meat for the remainder of the year very happily. Yeah. 
But I just had to have a realization like, okay, I have got to back off. Like, I'm going to be, I want to be on the road less. That's why I passed my mule deer tag in the Wasatch. Yeah. I just can't do it, man. It's uh, too much stuff has changed in my life. I got to reprioritize as much as I love it. The thing is, is I really enjoy those trips and hanging out. I think it, I enjoy hanging out with the, the crew more than the hunting itself. So I have to find the happy medium at least. Like a couple a year. Yeah. I mean, yeah, hopefully one then, of those being in my home state. And then doing the tack. The tack yeah. stuff is fun. Because then you get to like have all the goof off time. That's true. Yeah. And hang out time without. For me, it's going to be all based off of just the, the travel matrix. The risk yeah. versus reward of being out of town. I have to. Like plan, I said, I had a, plan that. this is the, the yeah. year of me going to, I'm going to act like an adult, maybe for like a little bit of time. And you know, it's either, I mean, we're, you know, 20 days in. So yeah, I'm so far I'm <laughs> deep so far. I've been successful. I think like one day <laughs> at a 20, so I'm nailing it, uh, but I don't always meet my goals. And, yeah, okay. uh, I just, I have to, I got to focus on the things that I do professionally. I have, pl- I have too many hobbies. I need another hobby. Like I need a goddamn hole in my head. Evan calls it uh, what hobby creep, right? <sighs> Because he turned down learning to hunt, right? He's like, no, 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 no. I can't do archery. That's hobby creep. It is hobby I can, creep. I can only focus on so many things at a time. I heard he didn't do ski patrol this year. I think he's focusing on the business. He should. Yeah. Yeah. Because the business will allow him to go and just rip powder ski days whenever, whenever he wants. wants. <laughs> with, yeah, with camera. Like, he can just do it whenever he wants. Correct. That's the place I want to get to. Good I job, Evan. I don't know how I'm going to get there. Fuck you, Evan. I said good job. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, could, that's still, I could still be like, good job, fuck you. But yeah. No, he's the most <laughs> awesome dude ever. Yeah. That's our power hour. What else? What do you want to close with? Uh, you want to get good at something? Do the reps. I can't argue that. That's the that's probably the most simplest formula. If yeah. you want to get good at something, do whatever that something is. Fuck yeah. And on that note. <laughs>